All right. We're talking today with Mr. Ken Scott of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University. Mr. Scott, can you begin by just telling us a little bit about yourself? For instance, uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in 1937 in Alma, Michigan. All right. My parents were both school teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first I remember is when I, as a little kid at, uh, in Sheridan, Michigan, which is about 45 miles away from Grand Rapids. I attended uh, Sheridan Rural Agricultural School. And how big was that? Uh, <laughs> not very big. It was a class D school. Uh, attended Central Michigan University mm -hmm. starting in 1955. Uh, graduated in 1960. Uh, commissioned as second lieutenant in the United States Army. I took four years of our senior ROTC. I, uh, First, now, tell me a little bit about uh, the ROTC training. I mean, what did that consist of in, I in the late 50s? I can be very honest with you. I don't remember a whole lot about college. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not the world's greatest student. I, first of all, I was not prepared for college coming from a very small school. I, uh, college was tough for me, personally. Uh, I was going to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to do. And, but... <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't do that. I stayed in the military for almost 25 years. But uh, uh, I recall not much about you know, about college life. Uh, I, maybe it was one of those things you just put it on your mind because it wasn't a happy experience or something that was funny. I remember funny things. I remember funny things about 25 years in the military. All the funny things. I don't remember bad things. I remember funny things. Okay. Do you have a general sense of sort of how much sort of time you spent on the ROTC part or what kinds of things they had you do for that? Well, back then, uh, every male except Korean veterans mm -hmm. had to take ROTC in college, first two years. So when we had a formation, we're talking about a pretty good, yeah. you know, because there were 5,000 students there. At least half were males, probably, or something of that very. So when we had a formation, we filled the football field. We had a formation. Uh, the same thing would occur after I moved as a junior up to the senior program. So we had people to <laughs> to drill and march and do things of that nature. So I had a pretty good idea about how to put a uniform on, how mm -hmm. to polish my brass. But uh, uh, that was it. I, I don't remember that much more. I. Uh, so they didn't give you things like any weapons training? Yeah, yeah. We had rifles and we did drill and uh, uh, got a chance to go to summer camp. I went, in fact, I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The first, my first experience is between my junior and senior year. And uh, they wanted everybody to go airborne. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, I'm not ready to jump out of a perfectly good airplane that's going <laughs> to land 10 minutes later. So... <laughs> that was not a big thing for me, was, to, was the airborne portion. I mean, it was fun. I, the, probably the thing I remember most was a drill instructor, airborne, who stood, I thought he was a humongous. He was just tremendous in size. He had shoulders that stuck out about six feet, and his waist was about a foot. And he wearing shorts and a little black T-shirt that said SFC something or other. And uh, I was really impressed with, with this guy. He was, he was in shape. He was tremendous. I, but uh, I don't remember a lot more than that we went to Bragg, the red dirt or the red clay and how it stained your uniform. Uh, I, I mean, it was fun, but mm -hmm. I, it, was nothing like, it was nothing like active duty. And so... Uh, uh, I don't remember that much more about Bragg, except going down there and for the first time in my my life, leaving Michigan and going to to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and and seeing what was there. But uh, all right, now what uh, made you decide to go into the military rather than become a teacher? Actually, my father, my father said to me, "You should take senior ROTC." But my dad and my mom both were teachers, and uh, I wasn't so sure, but he, he he persisted that I should take it, so I did. And uh, at that time, um, 
you could ask for you could ask for six months active duty. Uh, but when my when came graduation, and when I got commissioned, uh, my orders reflected that I was an OBV two, which, means? which is obligated volunteer for two years, mm -hmm. not a six monther like a lot of my friends were. So. I ended up going to Fort Eustis, Virginia, to the Officer Basic course for the Transportation Corps. Uh, Do you have any idea why you wound up doing that rather than something yes, else? Yes, it was based on my major. Mm -hmm. My major was Industrial Arts, so I either put I would fall into a category as either ar uh, Ordnance, mm -hmm. Quartermaster, or Transportation, and I didn't know anything about any of them, mm -hmm. and so I thought, hmm, Transportation, that would be a truck. Well, little did I know that transportation meant helicopters, it meant uh, ships, boats, it meant trains, and it meant trucks. And uh, when I went to the advanced, or to the basic course at Fort Eustis, out of 65 guys in my class, I was the only one that was going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I was going to Korea. My first duty assignment was going to Korea. So the A other- short tour. So the other- these guys were OBV six monthers. Okay. There might have been an OBV two in the bunch, but maybe not. And so I, I but I was going to Korea. Okay. So those guys weren't term. really in long enough for it to make sense to send them, them overseas. Were. No, a lot yeah. of them were not. There were a few, but there a lot of them were not. So I and I was married. My wife was pregnant, and off I went to Camp Casey, Korea, with the Seventh Infantry Division. And I was part of the 17th Transportation Battalion, and I got assigned to C Company, which was an armored carrier company. All right. Now, how did they get you out to Korea? <laughs> they put me on an airplane. Uh, in fact, it was a 707, and uh, we left. Uh, I left from San Francisco. Well, not really. I, the air base at San, mm -hmm. out there, and I flew to Hawaii. And this is before they went over the top. Everything was through. Everything went through Hawaii. Mm -hmm. We went to Hawaii, uh, flew from there to uh, Wake Island, where the when the wheels touched down on the runway, the rear end of the airplane was still hanging over the water. Mm -hmm. And we landed at Wake, uh, a, a little island sitting out there with one palm tree and an operation shack. Right. Refueled and then flew to Japan, to Tachikawa Air Base. Uh, they took me to Kashini Barracks, and I uh, was, was with two captains who had been somewhere. At, so mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was my, and then we flew from there to Kempo Air Base in Korea, mm -hmm. and got off the airplane, and that's the first time that I knew that I was, <laughs> I was no longer in <laughs> the United States. The, uh, the smell. And the bullet pockmark still in the terminal building. Um, at that time, the Koreans were uh, the smell. Mm -hmm. The smell was uh, <laughs> centuries and centuries of human waste into the rice paddies. Mm -hmm. Grew very large turnips. Right. I never saw anything that big in my mm -hmm. life. I mean, I'm talking turnips this long, <laughs> that big around, and. Uh, that was quite an experience. Then I was transported up to Camp Casey, which is uh, right about the 38th parallel, All right. north of Weejambu, and uh, was assigned to the, the unit, and I soldiered 24-7 I for supposedly a year. Uh, what did your duties up there consist of? I was a platoon leader initially. I was a platoon leader, and I was all of the special assignment jobs that were in the company. I was the unit. I was the unit custodian, or the the secretary for the unit fund. I did everything. I was the junior guy. I mm -hmm. was the mess officer. I was the supply officer. I was the armor. I was everything, for the start. I was everything. Uh, I, and the maintenance officer. I spent all my time in the motor pool, uh, pulling. Preventing maintenance on, an arm, on our armored carriers. Mm -hmm. We were the one of the first units in the United States Army that got the M113 armored personnel carrier. 
That's sort of the big box on tracks. Well, it's right? a bo yeah, it's a little box on tracks and it floats. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, <laughs> the thing about the 113 was it was uh, it was light enough it would float. It would carry a squad of men and uh, had a 50 caliber machine gun on top. And I was, and I support my particular, our particular company. We supported the battle groups. Uh, there were no at that time. That's what they were called, battle groups. So I either supported the 31st or the 32nd or the old guard, the third or whatever, based on an alert. I would go. I carried uh, the SOI or the signal officer instructions in my shirt mm -hmm. vest. And so when we would, and we would clear the motor pool in 30 minutes when alert was called. And by the time I was in the riverbed moving to wherever we were going, I'd get a f message through my ears, ear, the earphones, mm -hmm. that I was to go to whatever unit, and I'd pull my SOIs out and determine which unit it was that we were going to, which pickup point we okay. were going to. Now, is this about 1960 that this you're doing would be this? 19, I got there in 1961, and I was there through, through 62. Now, at this point, were things pretty routine, or were there still real scares about what the North Koreans... There were Koreans two divisions still there, the 1st mm -hmm. Cavalry Division and the 7th Infantry Division, right. and they were still shooting at each other across the border periodically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I woke up one morning with 90 days to do in country, and I went to bed that night with 180. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was not my, at that point, mm -hmm. was not my favorite person. <laughs> the Berlin Wall had gone up, mm -hmm. and so we were extended. But what that meant was anybody that had, that had come in prior to 1 October of 60 got to go home. All those of us that came after that mm -hmm. were extended. Well, they wiped out all the company commanders. Well, I got to be a company commander. I was the junior, I was a junior second, well, no, I was a senior second mm -hmm. lieutenant, and I got to be the company commander of this organization, of right. the comp C company. I had three other lieutenants that worked for me. Mm -hmm. I had a first sergeant, a, a man by the name of John uh, Mullally. Uh, the troops called him Hook because of his big nose, not to his face. Mm -hmm. He wore a set of jump wings on his chest with two bronze stars on them, which indicated he had made two combat jumps in World War II and lived mm -hmm. through it. I was very impressed with this man. Uh, in fact, he, the, in 25 years of active duty, the worst chewing I ever took was from my own first sergeant, and I was the company commander. He walked in front of my desk. He had placed a red square in front of the desk so many paces out, so when a troop came into the company commander's office, they stood on that red square. Mm -hmm. He knocked on the door. I said, come on in, Top. He closed the door behind him. He walked over to that square, stood at the position of attention, proceeded to <laughs> chew me out, and at the end of each sentence, he said, sir. What was he chewing you out for? I had screwed up because I had done something that he told me I shouldn't do in a form of a, some sort of a, of a written document, and he, he was right, and I was wrong, but it was like, it's like I was told in college, second lieutenants don't know anything, mm -hmm. and you've got to learn, and you've learned from your non-commissioned officers. You don't go up to them while the troops are standing there and say, I don't know what I'm doing, you do it in private, and 99% of the time they're going to lead you, they'll tell you how to do it right. It's the 1% that try to snow you, but as my operations NCO at Central Michigan told us, you'll know because you're smart enough to know that they're, you're being snowed. Mm -hmm. And anyway, he, uh, he, he uh, proceeded to chew my fanny, and uh, about 30 minutes later, at the end of each sentence, he said, sir. Right. And, he, and at the end of that 30 minutes, after about 30 minutes, I got a phone call from the battalion commander, uh, Sam Coggins, Lieutenant Colonel Sam Coggins, the finest gentleman that I've ever met, associated with. and. Uh, Colonel Sam said, uh, I understand you got chewed on today. And I mm -hmm. said, yes, I did. And he said, did you have it coming? And I said, yes, I did. And did you learn anything? I said, yes, I did. And he said, what was that? I said, 
Sergeant Mullaley has forgotten more than I'll ever know. And he said, you're getting with the program. <laughs> so that was, that was my Korean. And, and, and again, I, it was a fine experience. I, at that point, I decided that the Army was for me. All right. Now, while you were based in Korea, did you see much of the civilian population oh, yeah. or the Korean military? I mean, oh, yeah. what did Korea seem like to you at that time? Pretty backwards. Mm -hmm. When the when the coup took place, when Park Chung Hee took over in Korea, they had called an alert that morning, and uh, uh, Park Chung Hee basically got the Korean people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps to extract themselves away. I mean, look at the country today, yeah. and and this guy was a strong arm leader. And uh, he basically, that's, that's what he did. He just, and, and that was very noticeable. I went back to Korea 10 years after, the, after that. Mm -hmm. And I saw the four lane highways and the clover leaves and the, and the way that they were putting their stuff together. And, and that was very impressive. It was impressive to see Korea after that, after, especially after having been there and then go back 10 years later yeah. and see what was going on. So uh, I left, when I left Korea, I uh, came home to Michigan, picked up my wife and my son that I hadn't seen mm -hmm. and on his birthday, and uh, we proceeded to go to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, uh, as it was affectionately known as Fort Loss in the Woods. Uh, I was uh, put in charge of the motor pool there as a lieutenant. Uh, I had applied for regular army and uh, I appeared before the board at Fort Leonard Wood, which was very easy for me because all of my endorsements came from the 7th Infantry Division, mm -hmm. which at that point was made it imp very impressive that I was being recommended. Right. And uh, received my RA and then proceeded to be transferred to Fort Carson, Colorado, where I was a uh, given, taken to the uh, uh, 12th CAV, 4th Squadron, 12th Cavalry at Fort Carson, Colorado with the 5th Mechanized Division. And I was the XO of a CAV troop. I was a senior first lieutenant, but they wouldn't give me a troop because I was not CAV, I was mm -hmm. transportation. Right. And, uh, but they used my, I mean, they used my, utilized my skills because I, I come up with all the loading plans for the entire squadron, mm -hmm. which was basically something that I had learned a little bit about in transportation. So I set up the loading plans. I was a lot of jobs with the, with the CAV. I tried to branch transfer three times. And uh, each time I would ask, I was told, no, you cannot branch transfer to armor. I just thought that being a, being a CAV officer, or as they used to put it, clank, clank, I'm a tank, would be fun. I just thought that would be interesting. And uh, then I left, uh, when I made captain, I was transferred back to transportation. I was sent to Germany. So how long were you in Colorado then? We were, let's see, I got there in 62, later part of 62, and I was in Germany in 64. All right. And where in Germany do you go? I was at, I was at uh, uh, Mannheim, mm -hmm. and I was with the 28th Transportation Battalion of the 37th Transportation Group, which was the premier transportation organization in the United States Army. And I was given the command of a heavy truck company, 10-ton uh, tractors, big trailers, and we carried tanks all over. Uh, I commanded that company for over a year. Now this is, a, I, and I remember funny things about this outfit. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we moved a whole bunch of tanks from Mainz Depot to the Nancy, it's, pronounced, it's spelled like Nancy, mm -hmm. Nancy yeah. Depot yeah. in France. Mm -hmm. And Charlie de Gaulle kicked us out of, Ger out of France. That's right. And so we had to go back in and get all of those tanks and bring them out. And they talk about GIs not being, I mean, GIs are smart. GIs are clever. Uh, 
one of the things that G these guys did was they brought out German wine, or French wine. Mm -hmm. They uh, bought French bread and bought this French red wine, which was very good. Mm -hmm. And then they took a lo the loaf of bread and they stuffed the nose into the bread and they put it in the tube, the 90 millimeter tube <laughs> on the tank. And they was in locked position. So when they came across the border at, in France, the gendarmes would get up on the tank and they'd open the hatch and they'd look down inside and they didn't see anything in there except cables or whatever and they'd close the hatch and the driver would then proceed. Well, before he go into Mainz, they would come into Mannheim, and they would and they would park their vehicles, and then they'd go out and they'd unlock the travel lock position, pull the and and elevate the tube, mm -hmm. and the stuff would slide, slide right, right out. out. So they would get the loaf of bread and the bottle, and all this stuff would slide out. Now we're talking up to 16, 17 tanks mm -hmm. at a time. Now that's a lot of red wine. And I used to get the bread. They'd bring it into my <laughs> office and don't bread them. I never got, once in a while I'd get a bottle of wine, but most generally that was good. And that, you know, I remember, these, these are the type of things I remember about Germany. We, we did move a lot of tanks. We hauled them all over. Now what did Germany itself look like at that point? How well rebuilt did it oh, seem to be after the war? The Autobahns are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. we, they don't allow much tr truck traffic on their own. At that time, mm -hmm. they didn't allow much truck traffic. You had to get special permits for us to run those tanks up and down those autobahns. Mm -hmm. They looked about as thick as a runway on an air. I mean, one thing that Hitler did, well, when he built a road, he built a road. Yep. And they really were thick. And, uh, uh, but, and I, I had that company for a year. And then in 1965, uh, this order came in. It was late in the fall. This order came in through and uh, a lot of snow on the ground in Bremerhaven, and I was being terminated after I just left the company. I had the company for 13 months. I had just left the company. I had moved up to be the S3 of the 27th Battalion, and this order came through Vietnam, mm -hmm. and I was pulled from Germany and brought my family back to Michigan, and uh, put them in the, left them in Sheridan. Uh, both of my kids went to my mother for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and we were there three months, but they let us, let me take my family and all of my household goods to Fort Campbell, which right. was not, a, not normal. And at Fort Campbell, I activated the 592nd Transportation Company, a five-ton cargo group. Uh, the, kids that were in that unit were mostly draftees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably my favorite unit. Basically because we were all in the same boat together. From the start on 1 June 1966 mm -hmm. until I left the unit in March of 1967, we were together. We, we activated that company. Um, I didn't have a full complement of troops. Uh, we were getting very short because we were leaving there in September for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally one night I got a phone call from someone and they said that there were two truck, two bus loads of troops coming in from Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and that uh, these guys were coming into the, coming in part of the unit. And I went down to meet them, it was eight o'clock, and I remember getting, I remember them getting off the bus and they had no hair on their head. They had their fatigue jackets basically hung off the end of their, mm -hmm. off the end of their fingers. Uh, they were a sorry looking bunch. They were, not, they were not too thrilled to be there. And I told the first sergeant, I said, I'd get them fed, put them to bed, lay their Form 20s on my desk, and tomorrow morning I'll look at them. And I did, I looked at the Form 20s and uh, what is a Form 20? Form 20 was their kind of like their their little sheet that told about them, mm -hmm. about their education right. and things of that nature. And it was f funny because there were a lot of kids in there that were from New York, and I'm t New York City, mm -hmm. St. John's, NYU, whatever. 
most of these kids had never driven a vehicle in their life. They went to school by subway or by bus right. or whatever. Now they're in a truck company going to drive five-ton cargoes. And a lot of them had OCS-1 on them, which meant they were qualified to go to OCS if they wished. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to go to OCS. They wanted to drive a truck because they sounded like fun. Well, we in September, we left there by aircraft. We flew to Oakland, California. Uh, we got on board the UNSS Weagle, which was a vessel that was built to travel in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and we left for Vietnam right. by boat. Uh, Seventeen days later, we landed in Okinawa mm -hmm. at Naha, and the troops could get off the vessel at five o'clock, and they had to be back by midnight. The officers could get off, and they didn't have you back till one o'clock or one thirty or whatever. Well, from the where the vessel was parked, we the Navy Officers Club was right up the hill, mm -hmm. and we all knew where we were going. They had cold beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were going, so they left the the vessel pulled up, and when you if you stood on the railing and watched, there were taxi cabs lined up as far as the eye could see, in front of this vessel. Now there were were ten truck companies on this vessel. Mm -hmm. My company had 188 people. All of them, that was about what was on in, on that vessel. And these kids started off that vessel. And uh, I had, having been to Korea, I had, I had given them my little VD spiel. Mm -hmm. Using, a, well, I probably shouldn't say this. Anyway, I, I, I gave a v, VD about, and be careful. And uh, they got off the vessel and uh, about 12.30, I got back on board, and they were on the fourth deck down, uh, and I went all the way down, and when I walked into the, there were 300 troops in there, mm -hmm. 300 guys in this place, air-conditioned, bunk beds stacked up, and there were, they were wearing panties over their heads, they had <laughs> slips on, they had, I mean, they had all sorts of attire. We left that morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, the ship pulled out of the harbor, and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon was the first time there was any life on that vessel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an experience. We landed at Vung Tau, and they let off. I was hoping that I was going to get off of Vung Tau, because Colonel Sam Coggins, the gentleman that I had served with mm -hmm. in Korea, was the group commander in Vung, at uh, Long Bin. And I wanted to go to the, it was the 48th group, and that's where I wanted to go, mm -hmm. and, but I didn't. We went to Camp Ron Bay. Camp Ron Bay is uh, uh, a humongous sand dune sticking out of the coast of mm -hmm. Vietnam, and it's a very deep water port. Right. You can almost run a ship right up to the, right up to the bank. Mm -hmm. And they had put piers out. There were 35 ships sitting in the harbor when we got there. Uh, they told us we were going to discharge the following morning. So in the next morning, we all got up and we put on our fatigues and we put on our back, our all of our camp, all our stuff, our steel pots, the whole rifles. And we had we looked like we were going to go to the truck company in the attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, they let us off over the side, went over the side, and we got into to an LCU. And we floated into South Beach, and they, when they dropped the ramp, I'm standing there and I'm looking up at the shore, and there's two buses sitting there, with friends of mine standing there by the buses, laughing their heads off because I mean, literally, we looked like we were ready for combat. Yeah, they were invading the beach. We were invading the beach. We were doing a frontal attack on the beach, and it was just a hoot. And off the thing we got off the ship, we got or this LCU, we got off. <laughs> got on the buses, they took us over to this barracks, and then a little later they came and got me and they took me in the Jeep and I took me where I was going to have my company area, which was nothing but sand. Mm -hmm. Cameron Bay was a humongous sand dune, just huge. And they took me to this place, which was nothing but open sand, mm -hmm. just as far as you could see with sand, they said, this is where you're going to put your company area. And you've got 30 days to get this company, this thing ready, because your trucks will be here in 30 days. So the next morning we started in. I tried to get a bulldozer from an engineer unit, and the captain that had the bulldozer uh, 
Uh, well, he asked me, he said, do you have anything to trade? And I said, I don't have anything. We have nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't have anything to trade, then. <laughs> so my, my guys with a rope and a board leveled the sand by pulling it across mm -hmm. the sand, leveling it. We put 55 gallon drums into the sand. We put, built a framework on it of wood from our Wabtock kits. And I can't tell you what Wabtock stands for, but it's, it was enough lumber to build floors for right. all of our tents. We built GP large floors and put a GP medium tent on it so every one had a deck mm -hmm. on the back side. You know, you gotta be fancy, you gotta have a deck. <laughs> We could build some. We could build some supports on the inside, but we couldn't put walls on our tents. On them, this was according to the commander. But we did anyway. We put sides on them. Every day we'd roll a tent flap up just a little bit more. And so, so. Anyway, we built this whole area. We sandbagged the entire area, and I don't mean just up the sides. I mean we sandbagged the whole area, because when the wind would blow. It's the only place I've ever been where where this, it could rain parallel to the ground mm -hmm. and still have dry sand hit you in the face. It blew. So we, and we sent our area up. Uh, we did get some commitments for drivers to drive some trucks for some convoys. The, the beach was littered with supplies. They had not set up a depot. The stuff was there, but again, there were 35 ships sitting out mm -hmm. in that harbor to be offloaded. We didn't have any trucks yet. There were the two units that were sent there, the 545 and the 592s. We were sitting side by side, mm -hmm. waiting for our trucks to arrive. Uh, eventually, the trucks did come in, but we had run some convoys ear, ear before that. So you were had used somebody else's trucks? We were using some little two and a half ton trucks and we were using some drivers, yeah. And uh, actually they, they received some sniper fire mm -hmm. on some of these convoys. Uh, but you got your big trucks in. Got then. the big trucks in. Oh, before that, there was no beer at Cameron Bay. None. It was whatever, there was mm -hmm. none. And one of my NCOs found out that there was going to be a ship coming in and it had beer on it. I don't know what he did. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask. They didn't, they just, all of a sudden he took one of the Jeeps and one of the little trucks and he went down to the pier and they loaded six pallets of beer on that truck. That's 80 cases per pallet. They dropped one off at the stevedore unit that was working, one mm -hmm. off for the MPs and the other four came to the company. <laughs> So when I showed up back at my bunk one night, I had beer laying on it. You don't, I didn't ask any questions. I didn't want to have to put anybody in jail, so you don't ask questions. I was told by my first sergeant, don't ask, just go with the flow, mm -hmm. so I did. But uh, I commanded that unit from, from for up until March. And then I was transferred to battalion, and I became the S3 of the truck battalion. And then I left there in uh, the following September. I got orders, and I, we, and I left, and I came back to the States, went to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. Okay, let's back up again a little bit. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what conditions in Vietnam were like in that first tour out there. Uh, well, we were all living in tents mm -hmm. with a wooden floor. Right. Uh, were there a lot of Vietnamese on the base, or were there, there mostly just there Americans? There was a village there, mm -hmm. and the village had a uh, basically had a concertina wire around it. The troops could go down there; they could go down to to the village. Uh, again, there were bars, and mm -hmm. I mean all kinds of stuff that go on around <laughs> army bases. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, that they could go down there. We had Vietnamese that worked in our company area mm -hmm. as uh, um, taking care of the troops, mm -hmm. polishing boots, doing mm -hmm. the laundry, which they paid for. The guys right. had to pay for it. Right. Uh, I had a barber, my own barber. My mm -hmm. barber came from Missouri. He came to the unit. He brought his barber kit with him. Uh, he cut hair. He couldn't collect money. Mm -hmm. He couldn't take and say, oh, it's going to be X number. But he could take a donation. And everybody donated so much money. He cut the general's hair. He cut my, the group commander's hair. 
It got to the point where he was using my Jeep to go to cut the <laughs> people's mm -hmm. hair. Uh, they even transferred him once to the jump to the generals. And when he had the general in the chair that one day, he said, I want to go back to the company. I don't want to, I'll come and cut your hair, General, but I don't want to be here. And they transferred him back. So uh, Joe was, uh, Joe McDonald from Missouri was my, was the company bar barber. Mm -hmm. He cut everybody's hair. And uh, <laughs> we had a little barber shop, right? You know, an orderly room for him that he could, so he could do, do his thing. Uh, all kinds of, and again, these kids are all draftees. Mm -hmm. They're all smart. But my NCOs weren't dumb. My mm -hmm. NCOs realized that these guys were smart. Uh, I never had discipline problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, then I can remember. I did have one at Fort Campbell. It was funny. Uh, four of these guys took a 50-mile pass from Fort Campbell, and they went to Nashville, which would dead get them to Nashville. Mm -hmm. And then they got on an airplane. Two of them flew to Kennedy. One flew to O'Hare, and one flew to Dallas. About 2 o'clock in the morning, my phone starts ringing. MP mm -hmm. on the other end. Got one of your, two of your troops here. <laughs> what do you want me to do with them? Put them on a plane, send them back, tell them to report to me, 0800 tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. Well, I got three phone calls. So at 8 o'clock the following morning, here are these four kids standing mm -hmm. in front of me. And they can't understand how they got caught. We didn't have anything on GI. Mm -hmm. And I said, just go look in the mirror. You don't have any hair in your head. Mm -hmm. This was 1960. Yep. People with long hair. These kids got off their plane as soon mm -hmm. as they, as soon as they got off that plane, they had MP spotted, no hair. Where's mm -hmm. your leaf papers? Yep. And so, and then I asked them. I said, who did you get to see? Nobody. Did you have a good time? No, not really. How much did you spend? Well, it was almost their entire paycheck. Right. Well, that's enough punishment. I don't need. I mean. You, that was dumb. Mm -hmm. Get back to your, get back and do your thing, and that's probably about the worst thing that happened with these guys, with that that I was aware of until 40 years later at our first reunion when I found out about other stuff that had transpired <laughs> that I didn't know about until 40 years later. All right, uh, again to get back into Vietnam. Now, once you got your big trucks, are you being sent back We're and forth across the country? We did everything. We did beach clearance. We did clearance off of the off of the. Uh, uh, piers, mm -hmm. but our big job was the ammunition pier. We cleared the ammunition pier, taking and we, we're talking 24 hours a day because I got two drivers for each truck, and they did uh, ammo clearance. Mm -hmm. But we also ran convoys. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran one convoy, not not just us, but all of the, over 100 and some trucks to Queen Yan. And where? What part of the country was well, that? Queen in? Yan was north of us, mm -hmm. quite a ways. They could have had, they could have carried everything they we carried up there in an LST, and done the same thing. But mm -hmm. they wanted to prove they could run a convoy, so we ran this convoy all the way up to Queen Yan. Beautiful trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, you drive around, come come around the curve, and here be this little village sitting down on the, on the beach with the palm trees swaying mm -hmm. and the little huts and the beautiful beach and the water. I mean, what a picturesque spot. But we're running a convoy up there with all this stuff. I joke about we, that we took up stewed potatoes and we came back with stewed tomatoes. Uh, it, we, I don't know what we were carrying. It didn't make any yeah. difference. It was, just, it was just to say that we did it. Because yeah. the coastal highway or any of the highways were places where there could very easily be sniper attacks oh, or yeah, ambushes. Anywhere up and through there. But these are, I mean, these are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Just the beautiful beaches and stuff right. all the way up to Queen Yan. Just gorgeous. What a, and I always thought that Cameron Bay would be, what a place for a resort. Mm -hmm. Except the South China Sea had an awful undertow, but the but the, with a deep water port, and you could put hotels out there in that on right, that thing, right. and with the beach itself. Now there was a hospital unit that was on one end where they took a lot of the wounded guys, mm -hmm. and but their problem there is they had a lot of sharks in that particular area. Mm -hmm. The South China Sea wasn't so much, but it was a terrible undertow, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Periodically, we'd take trucks and the kids, get the guys down, and they'd get a chance to go in the water and frog around. There was a lake on the island, on Cameron, called Tiger Lake. And I know some of the guys that had gone walking, and they had found tiger tracks in and around mm -hmm. that thing down there. Uh, biggest thing we had bothering us were the geckos, and they loved pound cake. 
<laughs> we had a couple of them that would come up on the deck. You can actually almost feed them by hand. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty good sized. And they'd come up on deck with either red hair or blue head, and you could feed them uh, that. But uh, no, it, camera, the, the country itself was pretty. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was some gorgeous places. If it went, if it hadn't been anything going on, it would be pretty. We used to go to the train, which was, uh, well, I used to say it was the NVA on our center. I don't know if it was. There was an air base there. We traveled to there. We went to Fanring, mm -hmm. which was an air base south. We went to Dalat, where all the vegetables mm -hmm. were grown. Uh, took a convoy all the way almost to Cambodia, to the, where the 11th ACR was located. Uh, but we traveled all over that central period. I mean, periodically we'd get a convoy right. to go. But most of the time we were beach clearance and things of that nature, bringing, uh, taking the, especially the ammo area, mm -hmm. unloading ammo ships, taking it out and dropping off the stuff in the, in the uh, ammunition area. Uh, now, was Cameron? Was that a pretty secure area? Did you have Cameron was pretty good secure because we had a we had to cross the Maika Bridge, mm -hmm. which was a floating rubber raft bridge to get to the mainland. Mm -hmm. I did move a hundred and. Well, see, when I moved to the S3, we transported, I call it Operation, I called it Operation Casey Jones. We moved, uh, I was a project officer for it. We moved four diesel, four diesel locomotives, one steam locomotive, 1939 vintage, <laughs> and 100 railroad cars overland to this, to a head, at, to a railhead at Benoy. Uh, I didn't have any trailers that were large enough to carry. This was narrow gauge. Mm -hmm. I didn't have cars, trucks big enough to carry them, so I had to borrow. And I used the use the term that we were using U.S. aid mm -hmm. to the Vanell Corporation, who had 35-ton trailers, and we borrowed their trailers and hooked them to our five tons, so that when the kids were driving the trucks, actual the tractor, mm -hmm. when they turned around. There was a steel wheel just about that far <laughs> behind their head of this car sitting on right. this tractor or on the trailer. And we took them over the Mica Bridge. Now when we took the, the the diesel locomotives over, we had taken the trucks off, which are the wheels, mm -hmm. and we put one set of trucks in each five ton tractor or truck itself mm -hmm. and we picked the engine up and we set it on a low boy with blocks of wood to hold it. Mm -hmm. Well, when it crossed the Maika Bridge, the truck was actually going uphill. The <laughs> tractor would be like this, yep. going across. And there are big rubber grommets holding the air into these things. We'd pop those grommets. And there was a guy walking behind, and there was another vehicle coming behind him with an air pump, mm -hmm. and they'd fill them again and put the, new rubber, put the new rubber thing in it to hold the air in while we took those tractors, uh, take them across one at a time. We were only doing about five miles an hour because we were afraid that if we went too fast. If they had to stop, that thing could break loose at those cars. And we moved them across. I don't, and I don't understand. I still don't understand this day. They know there were they. There was no railhead at Cameron, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and why the United States <laughs> military, in their vast wisdom, sent us all these cars. There were 12 of them that were reefer cars for refrigerated mm -hmm. vegetables. And they moved, we moved them overland. They took them as far as Fanrang, and they were afraid to use them to go to Dalat because they were afraid they'd get shot full of holes. Right. So they just sat there on the track with the little engines running as refrigerator vehicle, mm -hmm. refrigerator cars for the, for the vegetables. They never took them on the rail. They never took them up to Dalat and back. Now, when you were sending guys out on convoys and going longer distances, I mean, were they getting shot at or were oh, yeah. there issues? Oh, yeah. And were you losing trucks? And You know, we never, I don't, I'm not aware of us ever losing a truck. I'm, a, I'm aware that we had maybe some bullet holes mm -hmm. in them. Uh, up north at Queen Yon, those guys made, they made, uh, uh, they armor plated some of their vehicles. Mm -hmm. While I was at in command, we did we did not do that. Mm -hmm. We had never put armor plating on any of our vehicles. We sandbagged them. Mm -hmm. We sandbagged the floors. We sandbagged the sides. 
We sandbagged around the drivers. They all wore flak vests. Mm -hmm. They wore steel pots. Uh, but we, we never armor plated them. When we first got to Vietnam, we had 50 or 60 caliber machine guns for our Jeeps. We had radios for all of our Jeeps. Mm -hmm. The minute we got there, they were taken away from us. The, the, we were given left with one radio and mm -hmm. one Jeep and a radio in the operation shack. That was it. Mm -hmm. They were given the rest of it all to the infantry. So we really had no support for convoy security. Right. We had, I remember going through, uh, going south to Fanrang. I took most of the convoys when I first got there. I uh, would carry a lieutenant with me, but we took, well, I took most of the convoys. And I remember we, that we came under fire. We either came under fire, we thought we came under fire, and the five tons just went off and left me. Mm -hmm. They could go across that bumpy road and not have a problem with that Jeep. If we'd have gone that fast, I'd have been thrown right, right. out of it. Uh, and when I come out the other side, it was a huge, I call it a coconut grove, just a huge bunch of trees and stuff. And they cleared it, and after when they got to the other side, they stopped and they waited, and I finally caught up to them. And basically, uh, I'm to this day, I'm not sure if we received fire mm -hmm. or if it was an artillery unit, re, or the Republic of Korea artillery unit that was f putting fire out. Mm -hmm. And so I still don't know it, it, because I, I I just don't remember. I, and maybe I don't remember because uh, it was something bad that happened, mm -hmm. and I don't remember the a lot of the bad. I don't remember the bad stuff. I remember the funny stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember the the funny things that transpired, things that people did, uh, but I don't remember bad. I don't remember a lot of the bad. I know what happened, but I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's something to do with the psyche or, or whatever. Help keep but yourself yeah, sane that way, maybe. Yeah, well, maybe that's it. I don't know. But anyway, I when I, uh, uh, that first tour, mm -hmm. I came back to Riley. Mm -hmm. uh, there were oh, both units were gone. The ninth division and the and the uh, first first division were gone. Mm -hmm. They were in Vietnam, and so uh, I went to work for the twenty third FASCOM, which is the Forward Area Support Command. Mm -hmm. uh, it was supposed to be a three star billet, and, but there was a full colonel that was. I mean, mm -hmm. it was activated. It was sent to Fort Riley. It didn't basically do anything mm -hmm. except prepare for summer camp. ROTC summer camp, mm -hmm. and I was given the mission. Uh, actually, I, actually, I was made a battalion commander. Uh, I made major while I was there, mm -hmm. and uh, the colonel told me, "said What you're doing is you're going to prepare for summer camp to provide transportation support for summer camp." So I was given a battalion, which was kind of a not really a. I I, I had units. Mm -hmm. I had guys, but it, not like a real, right. or like a real battalion. But anyway, I did, we got ready for summer camp. Uh, came come August for the when summer camp took place, and uh, I was then received orders, and I went to Fort Eustis, Virginia, and I went to the advanced advanced course. I finished the advanced course uh, because of my short tour in Korea and my short tour in Vietnam, mm -hmm. I didn't go back as fast as a lot of guys did in transportation. I got a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But then I went back, only this time I went back and I went to Long Bend and Saigon to the 4th Transportation Command. Okay, now when did you get back to Vietnam then? I went back in 69 mm -hmm. to 70. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, I was at Saigon and I was I was made the vessel movements officer. Now I knew nothing about vessel movements. Why that means on boats? earth? Yeah. Why on earth I was sent there? I'll never know because mm -hmm. it had nothing to do with trucks. The Fort Transportation Command was a uh, operated the terminal, ship terminal mm -hmm. in Saigon and at Newport. That was it. That's what they did. And I went to work as a major. I went to work as a with, for a first lieutenant. Mm -hmm. He was the vessel movements officer. He knew what he was doing, right. and I had no idea. Well, as it came to pass, when I moved from, then they transferred us housing-wise out to Long Bend. 
And the, the where was Long Bend Long relative Bend to Saigon? Long Bend would have been out, out near uh, the air base. Mm -hmm. uh, to the would have been to the east of Saigon. Mm -hmm. uh, big complex. Right. Long Bend was a big right. complex, uh, and uh, it was near. We were away from Tonsonut, but we were in mm -hmm. that air general vicinity. And I was the uh, given the mission of coordinating, coordinating the transfer of the 48th Transportation Group, which was a truck unit, mm -hmm. truck outfit, to the command of the 4th Transportation Command. Well, at least I knew what some, I knew what a truck was, mm -hmm. and and I went out. So I was the guy that did the letter, literally the transfer, so that when the headquarters staff left from the 48th group, the 4th Trans Command it basically took over their headquarters building and I became the highway operations officer mm -hmm. for the 4th Trans Command. A friend of mine by the name of Frank Frischione was the terminal operations guy. We were basically side by side in this building and the G3 took over the job, took over the billet that the commander of the, fourth, of the 48th group had. So we moved into their building, took over, and we then ran the battalions, the truck, but not mm -hmm. only the truck battalions, but the terminal operations people for the for the, that particular tour. Uh, I got medevaced out of Vietnam. Uh, <laughs> kind of embarrassing. We were playing volleyball mm -hmm. on a Sunday, and my knee went out, my right one, and I fell to the sand, and I. They, took me over to my hooch, put ice on it, and it was a Sunday, and it didn't get any better, mm -hmm. so they put me in a Jeep and took me to the 12030 VAC hospital, and the doctor said, we've got to, we're have got we going to take send you to Japan for surgery, because mm -hmm. we don't do surgery here. And I went to tell my boss that I was being sent to Japan for surgery, and he thought I was kidding. Mm -hmm. He thought a lot of things that I was, a lot of times I was, we had a good bunch. I mean, good sense of humor and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But anyway, and then finally he, I made him understand, yes, I'm going to Japan to surgery, but I'll be back. Don't take the air conditioning out of my window. I mm -hmm. will be back. So I went to Camp Drake. Uh, I laid in bed for 10 days. They had put a cast on my leg. Uh, and I put a blanket over my end of my bed so nobody knew who I was. Covered up my nameplate. Mm -hmm. And I volunteered to push uh, wheelchairs or whatever. Mm -hmm. I trans When I went there I, on the aircraft, I flew, there was a guy who had lost his thumb in the mm -hmm. Iron Triangle. Mm -hmm. There was a gent young man with a what they called a birdcage on his leg. He'd lost his leg mm -hmm. from the knee down. And I was traveling with those guys, and they knew that I was an officer, and I told them to swore them to secrecy, don't say anything to anybody. <laughs> I, I mean, it's embarrassing to go to a medevac flight when you got hurt playing volleyball. Right. You know, that's not, that's not swift. So anyway, I got there, and I finally, after 10 days, they finally did surgery. And uh, then they told me they were going to send me back to the States, to, Walt, to Valley Forge. Mm -hmm. And I put me on an airplane, and I flew to Valley Forge, basically for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And while I was at Valley Forge, they asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I want to go back to Vietnam and complete my tour. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that if I didn't, I'd end up going on another assignment, and bam, they'd have me back for another year. Right. I didn't want to go through that. And they said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, put it in anyway. Well, they did, and I got it. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going home. Coming back here to Michigan right. in October, first day of bird season was 20 October. Mm -hmm. I got a cast on my leg and a hip boot on my leg, and I went bird hunting <laughs> to get my leg ready. I got so I strengthened it up. So I got then I went back to Vietnam. I got back to the rep replacement depot, and I finally got to a phone, and I called Frank Frischoni up, mm -hmm. and I said, "Come and get me because they're going to send me somewhere else." Mm -hmm. And I, so he came, I signed out, and I went back to my, where I was, went back to my unit, to the unit. Did you still have your air conditioner? I still had my air conditioner in the wall. It was still there. 
but they had taken all my clothes and, uh, and shipped them somewhere, <laughs> and I had lost two foot lockers of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I got back to my unit, and I completed my tour, uh, came back to the States, uh, went to back to Fort Eustis, uh, was with the uh, Transportation Command uh, R&D unit. Uh, my major project was working on a new heavy truck to move tanks. Uh, from there, I went from there to, let's see, Command General Staff. No, I went to Japan. Mm -hmm. Spent three years in Japan with West, with uh, uh, User J, United States Army Japan, and part of the Ninth Corps. Did you get to bring your family with you to Japan? Oh yes, oh yeah. Find the best tour we ever had. I, mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed Japan. I, that was a fantastic assignment. <clears throat> Got a chance to travel. My wife and I went to Hong Kong. Um, uh, I went, got to go to Korea, see a Korea again. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, just a great assignment with great people. I, uh, I was told that I would not go to Command General Staff College. I didn't know why. But they told me I wouldn't go. So I started taking it by correspondence. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, one day I was sitting in the operation, I was on duty. Uh, duty officer and I was in the operations shed, a uh, secure area, and I had all my maps up on the wall, and I'm sitting there and all, the door opened behind me and <clears throat> I heard this voice say, uh, ask me what I was doing, and it was General Jack Guthrie, who was just a peach. I mean, this guy was unbelievable. Three star, just fantastic individual, mm -hmm. a great, his wife was just the sweetest lady, and he says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm working on uh, avenues of approach for this particular problem. And he came over, and came over and he's looking at the map and he said, it's right here. And I said, no, sir, I think it's right here. I think this is the one. Well, I think it's this one. He said, well, when you get your blue goose back from Leavenworth, you come and tell me. The blue goose was the answer sheet. Mm -hmm. So I submitted my stuff and it came back and I was right. <laughs> so I took my blue goose and I went up to the front, I went up, and his, his chief warrant officer, administrative assistant was there, and I said, is the general busy? He said, no, he's just sitting in there. I said, can I put my head in? He said, sure, go ahead. Well, anyway, I walked by the chief of staff's office, and I walked by the one-star general's office, and I opened, and I knocked on the door, and I stuck my head in, and I said, you were wrong. <laughs> well, they heard me. They thought, oh, my God. So, really? And he said, and he says, no way. I said, yes, sir. Here it is right here. And so I went over and I'm sitting, standing by his desk. And he's looking at the blue goose and he's saying, no way that you, that, and, he, and, when I, and the <laughs> chief of staff and the one star sitting there watching us and wondering what in the world is this lieutenant colonel saying mm -hmm. to this general about how wrong he was or major. I was a still mm -hmm. major. And anyway, I completed command general staff by correspondence. No more than completed, and I got picked up for the regular course. Mm -hmm. So we went back to Fort Leonard Wood, or Leavenworth, Kansas, mm -hmm. outside the prison, by the way. Right. The, and 10 months of study and everything. Uh, at this is a point when I, I didn't think I was smart enough to work on my college degree, mm -hmm. master's degree, and still do Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. I just didn't think I was capable of doing that. But I got 12 hours towards my master's mm -hmm. because I completed 11 worth. Right. So from there, we went to Hawaii. And I was a staff officer at uh, Westpac, Westcom in, the, in, in Hawaii. And on Wednesdays was PT day for the rest of the staff. So Wednesday afternoon, my secretary was taking college courses. And I had found out that Central Michigan was there with mm -hmm. the Air Force, and so I started working on my master's degree at the Pink Palace, which is Triple Army Medical Center, mm -hmm. and I started going to class to get my master's. I went for six months. I took uh, Friday from 5 o'clock until 10, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, three weekends a month mm -hmm. of the month. The, middle, the next to the last weekend was for study, to do whatever I had to do. Six months later, 
with my 12 hours, my 18 hours. Mm -hmm. I had my master's degree in management. Uh, did well. Did well on my master's degree. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Came back from Japan, and uh, when we were in Hawaii, my son graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. Fact of the matter is, on the, <laughs> the other day we were sitting there, and, and uh, he called me and said I on, was on TV. And I said, how's that? He said, on YouTube. And I said, uh, ask him, he said, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E, and, right, and then when you get there, click on Barack Obama basketball. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. Sure enough, kicked it on. Barack Obama went to Punahou High School, mm -hmm. a private school mm -hmm. in Hawaii, playing basketball. My son went to Moana Loa High School, and here he is playing basketball against Barack Obama. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, he uh, finished high school. He could have gone to U of H mm -hmm. <clears throat> real cheap mm -hmm. at that time yeah. as a being over there right. because they were school. But the credit hours were not transferable back to CONUS. No school in the, back here in the continental United States accepted those credits. Mm -hmm. Yet they got a marine biology program that's as world, yeah. world famous. So anyway, he decided to go to Chaminade for a year. So he was going to Chaminade. In fact, it was the year that Chaminade beat uh, University of Virginia mm -hmm. when Ralph Sampson was their center. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very difficult to beat five players and two striped shirts all on the same floor. Mm -hmm. No way can they, was there gonna happen. It was kind of a, <laughs> anyway, we stayed, in, we stayed there and uh, I, when we left Hawaii, I had asked for ROTC duty. I wanted to be the professor of military science at Central Michigan, mm -hmm. but they already had a gentleman had been in, got in there a year earlier, mm -hmm. and the only job open was Northern Illinois University, which is a MAC school. Mm -hmm. So I went, we went to DeKalb, Illinois, mm -hmm. which in the summertime you can't see anything because the corn's so high. Mm -hmm. But in the wintertime, you can see forever. Right. You can see forever because there's nothing there. But anyway, my son, I, I, had the, I was a professor of military science at Northern for three years. Uh, good job. I really got civilianized mm -hmm. being at a university like that. And uh, my son took, took, eventually took the ROTC program. Uh, my daughter at that point was also a student at Northern Illinois. Both of them are graduates at North mm -hmm. from Northern. Uh, my son went, went in the Army, uh, military intelligence, Fort Huachuca, mm -hmm. was sent back to the 25th Division in Hawaii. So he lived there for three years and he served the 25th mm -hmm. for five years. So he was pretty well, you know. My daughter, uh, finished up at Northern. In the meantime, uh, I finished my three-year tour. I was ready to retire. Mm -hmm. I was ready to get out. And uh, there was no job available back here in Grand Rapids or anywhere in this area. Uh, in 1985, when we moved to Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. that was our 26th move. Mm -hmm. We've lived, lived a lot of places. We've lived across the central portion of the United States between Leonard, between Fort Eustis, Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Riley, Fort Carson, Colorado, mm -hmm. Leavenworth, Kansas, mm -hmm. and Fort Campbell, Kentucky. There is no place on this green earth as nice as West Michigan. I mean, there's just no place else. As far as I'm concerned, this is it. This is home. This is where everything's at. I love the Four Seasons. I don't, not really crazy about all the snow, but I mean, it's a great place to live, great place to raise your family. I mean, with the thing we got. But anyway, I, I couldn't retire, didn't have a job. Mm -hmm. So I got a job at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And I spent two years there as their director of logistics for the post. And when it finally, I kept harassing Lieutenant Colonel Dick Hargrove, who was the guy in charge of the ROTC program, for the Grand Rapids Public School System. And I harassed him for two years, three years, about a job. Mm -hmm. Finally, one day when I called, 
He said, hey, there's going to be one open come November. I slapped my retirement papers in. I had 90 days of leave coming. Mm -hmm. My wife and I came back to here to Michigan. We lived at Rainbow Lake, just above uh, uh, Gowan. Mm -hmm. Okay. I actually know where that is. You, got, you know where Gowan is? You travel up north, just north of Gowan, cross the road that goes to Truffaut, or as you want to be French, Truffaut, mm -hmm. and go to Rainbow Lake. We stayed there, and his, he had built some condos up there. We stayed there until January. We bought our house here in Grand Rapids. I, had, I taught at Union for uh, four and a half years. I taught at Creston for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Uh, when Dick Hargrove retired, I became the director for eight years, had eight years in Grand Rapids school system, spent 14 years in the ROTC system in Grand Rapids, uh, thoroughly enjoyed the kids. Kids are fantastic, kids. Uh, got away with things in my classroom that other teachers couldn't <laughs> get away with. Uh, <laughs> you grew up in my class. You go to the front leading rest position and you stay there until I get tired. Mm -hmm. uh, or you hold a chair over your head <laughs> because you can't do it, don't know anything else to do with your hands. This is not punishment. Mm -hmm. This is additional training. Uh, I got away with, again, I, I, I never was mean to a kid or anything, mm -hmm. but they knew why they were there. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, that's the beauty of the ROTC program. Those kids want to be there. It's not like, it's not like taking English 101 mm -hmm. or English or math or whatever. They, they didn't have to be in ROTC. They could be somewhere else. And uh, thoroughly enjoyed my 14 years in the ROTC. Met a lot of good kids. Met a lot of great parents. Mm -hmm. uh, thoroughly enjoyed my, and I guess that brings me up to speed. I re, Retired in 1999, and uh, as my wife would say, the smile has not left my face since then. All right. And I've met a lot of great people. I'm a life member of the VFW in my hometown of Sheridan, have been since 1969. Mm -hmm. I'm a life member of the American Legion Post. I belong to American Legion Post 311. I'm a life member of the Vietnam Veterans Association, and I, that's Chapter 18. I'm a member of the Army-Navy Club of Grand Rapids, which, used, which was formed about 1920. Uh, it is the Officers Club of Grand Rapids, and I'm a member of Grand Rapids North Kiwanis. Um, thoroughly enjoy. My planner is thicker now. Mm -hmm. has more, I don't have a BlackBerry. I don't know how to operate it. don't want to. I write everything down. I have a planner. I have everything in there, mm -hmm. and I love to play golf. I play as much golf as is, is possible. Um, I have two granddaughters here with my daughter, who's married to an attorney. My son is an ER doctor in Kansas City, has four children. Mm -hmm. We go to Kansas City to see them. Uh, I go into withdrawal from not getting enough hugs from my granddaughters, <laughs> so I can't be away very long. We spend the month. <clears throat> We spend the month of February in Alabama, half since about 1998. And I miss my hugs from my granddaughters. So I have to, can't be away too long. I have to get back so I can get my fix. And uh, I guess that's about the extent of my, of my career in the, the Army and with the uh, ROTC program. Okay. Now I'd like to kind of ask you a couple of questions about things. You were in the Army for a long time uh, and a lot of things happened. I mean the whole of the whole Vietnam thing happened and um, along with a lot of the negative publicity that came out of it and a lot of changes and downsizing and a lot of other things that went on through all of that. Uh, as an institution, I mean how much do you think it changed as, as an organization or as a group or in terms of its morale? Uh, did you notice much of a shift? I don't recognize Army. today's army mm -hmm. from what I from what I knew. What's different about it? I think probably the technology and the and the smartness of the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't 
you don't do the things that these kids do today with technology with the McNamara 5 million or whatever mm -hmm. that number was. I mean, these kids, today these kids are smart. They, and and uh, at least what I can see, that, mm -hmm. that the technology itself has really, has really, has really perked it. I mean, I, I listen to things that, that are going on. I get stuff over my over the internet mm -hmm. that I, from friends of mine who served with me mm -hmm. or after me, and from my, I mean, the group of young men that I commissioned in 1983. Those guys have re are retiring mm -hmm. from the army. Of that group in 1983 that I commissioned at, four, at Northern Illinois University, there's a doctor, my son. Mm -hmm. There are six full colonels. Mm -hmm. Of those six full colonels, one's a female. Mm -hmm. There's of those six young uh, six guys, gals. Three of them, I believe, are going to make brigadier. Two of them are brothers. They're twins. Mm -hmm. That was a fantastic gr group of kids. These kids have really gone, really gone and done things. The group of '82, they have too. There are no full bulls, no full bulls in that bunch. Mm -hmm. But those guys are all retired as lieutenant colonels. And here I'm getting, and it makes you feel old because yep. I'm getting an email from them, mm -hmm. and you know, there's, t <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting, we're retired. I got this many kids, you know, and I can, and, and they let me know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, the internet is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And, and you think about just something that simple and all the other things that these guys have got and the soldiers today have to work with technology-wise. I, I, it's, it's, it's just, it's fantastic. I, mm -hmm. Now, they got to go back into when you were still in. At the point when you went to Northern Illinois to start teaching, you're going from the military and you're going onto a college campus in like 1971. Uh, how did people 1980. there? Uh, 80. Okay, so that's that's later. Sorry, that later. So that that's that's post Vietnam to some extent. How did people treat you or respond to you at that point? Was it just another colleague? Uh, was there some degree of, of of tension or some people who maybe weren't sure they liked the military or? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how to say this to a person who's already who is a professor. I used to be invited to all of the get-togethers that the president put on. Mm -hmm. That was the most boring <laughs> thing that I ever had to do. So things don't change that much then. They, they if still you can did be. Not, if you could not talk mm -hmm. on a level about their subject matter, you couldn't walk up to them and say, "Gee, the weather was great today, wasn't it?" I mean, they'd look at you like you were you had your head screwed on crooked. And it was boring. I mean, there were exceptions. Mm -hmm. There were people that used to come to my office and have coffee with me, mm -hmm. okay? Pro-military. Mm -hmm. My boss was a female, associate, the provost. She, she was a super lady, but mm -hmm. she was a mathemat mathematician, mm -hmm. PhD. I had nothing whatsoever in common mm -hmm. with her. I mean, she was a great boss. She just left, she left me alone. Mm -hmm. But nothing in common with her. Uh, you know, when when the, when the Vietnam vets came home, they were treated with disrespect. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike today, thank goodness mm -hmm. for that. I mean, something we did learn out of Vietnam in the end. Yeah, yeah, I. Now, I do not recall ever having anybody spit on mm -hmm. me or anything like that. But I have, of the group that I took to Vietnam in 66, some of those guys felt it, saw mm -hmm. it, were treated that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I don't recall, oh, I do too. I, in 67, when I came home, my family was already in Michigan, already in Sheridan, and I, the Army had told me that if I could get accepted at Central Michigan or any place, mm -hmm. I could go bootstrap. 
which means? Well, bootstrap was a program to get my master's degree mm -hmm. and the Army would fund it. Right. So I went up to Central Michigan with my wife to see about getting back in the school. Now I knew that I was not the world's greatest student. Mm -hmm. I knew that. From the get-go, there was no doubt I was not the world's greatest student. And I was willing to go on probation, and which is what I mm -hmm. told them. I said, hey, I know I not was not a great student. I know that I graduated with a C. You know, I know that. Mm -hmm. But I said, and over the years, I've learned a little bit. I would like to come back. I would like to get my master's degree here at Central while well, my family's here under the bootstrap program. And I was told by the, at that time, the gentleman who was in charge of the graduate student program, mm -hmm. this is 1967, I was told that I was not welcome on campus mm -hmm. because I was a killer of women and children. Right. Now, my wife was completely surprised that I did not deck him mm -hmm. right there. She, she was very proud of the fact that I did not hit him. And so when I left, my professor of military science, who went central, mm -hmm. was then working in the finance office in, over there. And I went to see Colonel Burns, who was working at cam on campus. And that's what I, he just said, you're probably better off not coming back up, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the way it is. The funny thing is, about a week and a half later, I got a letter from Central Michigan wanting money. <laughs> oh, well. The vice president, and I responded to the letter. Mm -hmm. He couldn't believe that anybody had said that to me. Well, my wife was there to listen to it. So, but anyway, I fooled him because I still got my yep, degree you did. from Central Michigan, and I got it in Hawaii with a, and Central's one of those schools that has a very large program mm -hmm. associated with the Air Force. Right. And uh, a lot of officers are Central Michigan graduates with a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I fooled them. I still got it. I didn't get it in what I wanted to get it in, but mm -hmm. I got it. I got a master's degree. And the military didn't care. The military mm -hmm. could care less. If it was an underwater basket weaving, they could care less. All they cared was the fact that you had a master's degree. Now to look back on the whole thing now, if you're kind of advising somebody, you know, coming out of you know high school or, or college or whatever, uh, are there people you would encourage to go in, into the military, and if you did, for what reasons? I think that every again, I think that every 18-year-old should have to serve their country. Mm -hmm. Now I do not mean that to say that they have to go in the military, mm -hmm. because there are other things they can do for their country. It's very easy to tear down something that you have not to have, had to help build. Mm -hmm. I always felt that in the ROTC program, the junior ROTC program within the high school, that if we had done our mission, if when a young man or young lady went to a Tiger game, a White Caps game, a Griffins game, a Lions game, or whatever, and when they said we're to say, ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise for the playing of the national anthem, that they knew enough to take off their hat and place their hand over their heart and stand at the position of attention mm -hmm. to show proper respect to the flag. You can watch, I can watch and tonight, tonight, I can watch the Detroit Red Wings and the Dallas hockey game. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that if the young lady from Detroit sings the national anthem, and as they pan the audience, that I will see a number of young people and old people who will not lay to put their beer down, mm -hmm. will not have their hand over their heart. Yet I will see some that can. I don't expect that the foreign hockey players mm -hmm. will stand to do that. I do expect that those of those are, and there aren't that many of them, Americans to do that. But they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. The parents don't know any better. Nope. The kids don't know any better. And and I I, I think that's that that's really too bad that they don't know enough to show proper respect for the flag. 
I got a problem with the United States Congress that they haven't needed a criminal offense to burn the flag. But I, there's, you know, that's just the way they are. I, I don't know. I, I'm 70 years old. I, I, uh, I, I fly the American flag. I have it lit. Mm -hmm. So I fly it 24 hours a day. I do not bring it down. I mean, I know the governor can say if you put it at half staff. Mm -hmm. There's only one day that you put it at half staff, Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. And you bring it, it goes to half staff until noon, and then it's put back up again to the top. Uh, I support the troops. I don't necessarily support the war. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there's one American life that's worth that entire country. I do think that eventually, at some point in time, and maybe it's now, we are going to have to fight the religious, <laughs> I'm not sure if I right or left or whatever, because they want to bury us. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that our present Congress, to include the commander in chief, have provided all the support that they should have for the troops that are being sent mm -hmm. to Iraq or Afghanistan. And I know that there are many officers out there who would say, well, you don't, you don't support the troops. Yes, I do. I do support mm -hmm. the troops, and I feel that way. I think, I think that... Uh, well, there have been plenty of officers, even ones currently serving, who've pointed out the various places where the support wasn't there, too. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, I never worked for a, I never worked for a, for a commander mm -hmm. in, 20, in almost 25 years of service whether it be at the company, battalion, the group, the division, whatever level, I've never worked for a jet for a person who did not try to surround themselves with the most capable people that were available to them. And as a political statement, I do not believe that the commander in chief did that. I don't think, I, th I think they, he did a disservice to the troops because he did not surround himself with the best people available. Colin Powell, Colin Powell was a great, is a great general. Mm -hmm. He was a super secretary of state and I think he was lied to mm -hmm. to go and he was the only person that could go in front of the United Nations and say what he said and be believed. And I think he was fed a bunch of BS by someone and he took the fall for what was what went on. His fault was being a good soldier. He, he his had fault an order was doing and he exactly it. right. And I think and I think that's I just think that that transpired. That happened. And for the, for a year after that happened, you never heard anything out of him. Mm -hmm. But you heard a lot of stuff from Mr. Rumsfeld, mm -hmm. who I think was the lousiest Department of Defense person we've ever had in office. I don't think that Mr. Cheney is, a worth, it, or is worth it. And let me put it this way. I am a conservative person. I'm probably, I don't know that I've ever voted Democratic. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Maybe I have. But I'm, I just cannot believe that what transpired in Washington with people being lied to by, I, and that bothers me because mm -hmm. I don't think, you, I think you should tell the truth. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, our prior commander in chief uh, was a draft dodger. Mm -hmm. Pure and simple draft dodger. Uh, and but, but the people of this country elected him twice. Uh, ran off to Canada. Uh, the present commander in chief, whether it made a belong, might have belonged to the National Guard, but I'm not sure that he ever earned his stripes. Uh, being, but anyway, yeah, that's yeah. those are political statements, mm -hmm. and I don't think that. I mean, that's but that's the way I feel. Oh. I just feel that way and I yeah. 
And as and a, that's one thing about it, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. By golly, the guys in World War II made sure mm -hmm. that we can say what we feel. And mm -hmm. I, so, but. Yeah. All right, well, you know, as, as a career military man, you speak with a certain degree of, of, of authority on, on a <laughs> point like that. Sort of that. Well, yeah, oh, I, because you went through it, and, yet, and part of, the, there, is a, there is an issue of trust there. I mean, you, you are being trusted to do your job, and on some level, you have to trust them to make the right decisions, and yeah. that can often be a hard thing as a man, I suppose, yeah, yeah. for all people. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this has been a very, very fine conversation, and thank you very much for coming in and talking to hey, me today. Anytime. All right. Now, at this point, we can.